Anania, nerds in paradise. One balmy Bananian morning, Fritz van Damme, programmer and natural-born nerd, was ambling thoughtfully around the garden of Manta Ray Bay Resort. The resort, otherwise known as the Technode, housed the offices, lodgings and workshops of Digibeat, a Dutch high-tech startup recently established on the small West Indian island of Banania. Sadly though, Fritz's peaceful morning stroll was cruelly disturbed as he discovered that all the tropical plants, shrubs and grasses seemed to have sprung up overnight and were collaborating to impede his otherwise carefree progress. But, being born and raised in Toledo, Ohio, in America's vast Midwest, Fritz was never one to be intimidated by nature and immediately came up with a plan to combat the ever-encroaching vegetation. This plan was cleverly based on the output of sensors that the Digibeat team would carefully position around the property. These sensors would accurately report when grass was growing too long, bushes needed trimming, and weeds were, well, in need of weeding. All this information went into a central application, which then alerted all the relevant pieces of Digibeat gardening equipment to chop, trim, water, weed, in fact, do whatever was needed to bring their particular bit of nature under firm control. Well, the Digibeat team enthusiastically embraced Fritz's idea and went to work developing the prototype. The founder and lead engineer, Nigel Nickleby, though, had a tendency to use military language. And as a result, whilst developing the prototype, the system would send rather cryptic messages to the system's administrator, who was predictably titled, The Commander. The messages, for instance, would ask the commander for permission to send assault units into action and to launch an all-out attack on the offending wildlife. When the designated commander responded with permission to attack, all the relevant equipment swung into action, snipping, chopping, mowing and watering. Now, being convinced that Digibeat was Banania's secret weapons development unit, the ever-vigilant Euphonian Intelligence and Educational Involvement Organization, the EIEIO, on Banania's neighbouring island Euphonia, was constantly monitoring the team's messages. A somewhat sleepy monitoring agent was suddenly and completely woken from her reverie as she intercepted the prototype app's message, asking for permission to send assault units into action to launch an all-out attack. The Euphonian military leadership, having a somewhat suspicious and, dare we say, paranoid nature, quite naturally assumed that this meant an all-out attack by Banania on Euphonia. So they dutifully put all their defence units on red alert. So, when a little later the prototype commander's response was sent, giving permission to attack, the Euphonians scrambled all their military units to protect themselves from the impending Bananian invasion. Well, the resulting chaos resembled something like an uncoordinated and blindfold three-ringed circus, with all the wild animals and a large number of clowns running around in circles and repeatedly falling over each other. In fact, 
everybody was in such a mess trying to get themselves out of a mess that the euphonian generals finally and regretfully decided that it was hopeless and realized that they were indeed already defeated without even a shot being fired. So an emissary was hastily dispatched to Banania with Euphonia's terms of surrender. On arriving at St Hilda's Marina though, the Euphonian emissary discovered the Honourable Sir Archibald Berkeley, Prime Minister of Banania, sitting on a folding chair, wearing an ageing t-shirt and somewhat ungainly shorts. He didn't seem to be coordinating anything at all, let alone an invasion. He was, in fact, fishing. Some delicate diplomatic inquiries by the Euphonian emissary revealed that the Prime Minister was not at all interested in accepting Euphonia's terms of surrender. In fact, he had no idea what the poor emissary was babbling about. It was, though, fast approaching four o'clock in the afternoon, so the Prime Minister naturally assumed that the Euphonian emissary had simply dropped by for a cosy chat and a nice cup of tea. The emissary later returned to Euphonia where the military hierarchy unravelled his somewhat garbled report that they were not, in fact, on the brink of an invasion at all. But because of the way their minds worked, they immediately began to believe that this was all a cunning ruse, a ploy by Banania to test Euphonia's state of military readiness. Jean-Napoleon Labouche, Euphonia's short, indeterminately old, and perpetually bad-tempered dictator and lifelong president, nicknamed Nappy by his many detractors, or at least those who survived, was even more unhappy than usual. While feeling secretly relieved that they had narrowly avoided an enemy invasion, he insisted that they get their own back and teach their neighbours a clear lesson. And this would be done, he said, by stealing Digibeat's plans and building Euphonia's own digital high-tech weapon system with which to invade Banania. Send in a team of our best operatives in the dead of night and not the parrot. Break into their facilities and steal all of their plans. <laughs> Simple, no? <clears throat> oh, there may, may, may be a little problem with that. Mr. President, Your Honour. Problem? What problem? What problem? I have thought of it myself. How dare there be a problem? Uh, <clears throat> well, oh, oh, well, brilliant, though the plan obviously is. Well, the last time we attempted to send a team in, it was fired upon by some kind of automated security system. And if you've no idea what he's talking about either, listen to the Foul Feeder episode and all will become crystal clear. Well then, kidnap one of them and torture him cruelly until he tells about this system they have invented. Well, understandably, nobody really felt brave enough to start a real invasion by kidnapping one of Banania's brightest brains. Instead, someone suggested a less draconian solution. That was to invite Connor O'Connor, Diggy Beat's impetuous marketing director, to visit Euphonia and gently interrogate him about the all-out attack system they had developed, preferably after a few drinks and a good meal, and maybe another few drinks. One small snag was that the most obvious agent to carry this out, Doris Dutherby, had had her cover blown by the traitorous Clarence the Parrot, once pride agent of the EIEIO. So she would not be able to coax Connor to visit Euphonia without him becoming suspicious. 
Under the smouldering gaze of the increasingly agitated president, one of his councillors had a bright idea of organising a competition which Connor would, of course, win. And so, a few days later, Connor O'Connor received a legal-looking letter, which informed him that, out of the many participants, he had won the grand prize of an overnight stay, an extensive meal at Euphonia's top hotel, luxury transport and generous open bar included. Delighted that he was once more the recipient of the look of the O'Connors, Connor found himself whisked away in the luxurious transport, which, he failed to notice, bore a remarkable resemblance to Doris Dutherby's bright red sports car, which you can hear all about in the Coconut Cropper episode. Fortunately, as we all know, Connor O'Connor was almost miraculously clueless about anything technical. So he wasn't able to divulge any sensitive secrets, even if he wanted to. He was, though, a natural-born salesman, who, even after sampling a very significant amount of alcohol, correctly discerned that the Euphonians were particularly interested in Digibeat's latest development, the highly automated all-out intervention system, the H-A-A-O-I-S, or A-O-I-O-S for short, and he proceeded to sell them a full set on the spot. The next morning, as the Euphonians waved goodbye to a cruelly hungover Connor O'Connor and a suitcase full of cash, they congratulated themselves on a mission well done. They'd managed to purchase a totally automated weapon system at a ridiculously low price, which they attributed to the effects of the remarkably large amount of alcohol muddling Connor's brain. This was so effective that he omitted a significant number of zeros from the final price, which shows how little intelligence they'd gathered about Connor O'Connor. Of course, the Euphonian hierarchy were not interested in any way, shape or form in the actual operation of the system. So when it arrived, the task of installing it was left to uninformed, uniformed minions. They carefully followed the detailed instructions that came with the system, placing sensors in their correct positions around the presidential palace, and the whole thing was set up precisely as it should be. After a few test runs, the Euphonian generals were well, somewhat concerned to discover that rather than initiating a strategic missile attack, the system proceeded to mow the president's lawn, trim the hedges and eradicate all kinds of troublesome weeds. Though the generals believed that they had been duped by an intelligence mastermind, their president completely forgot about the weapon system and the planned invasion, being highly delighted that his palace grounds had never looked so pristine. And an unusually happy president was at least one less problem for the Euphonian generals. In the meantime, though, the Euphonian public had heard all about the near invasion and, with true patriotic passion, proceeded to send gifts to the Digibeat team in an effort to win their favour before the real Bananian invasion, which they expected to happen in the very near future. And, within a few short days, the Manta Ray Bay Resort became inundated with a huge quantity of fruit, flowers, spices and bottles of rum. And it also became the somewhat unwilling home to 17 goats, 8 pigs, 54 chickens and a rather aged donkey 
name.